what's the link, if any, he said, between yoga and the conservation of nature? We were speaking earlier about how here at Parmarth there's so much yoga and such an emphasis on yoga and also how there's this emphasis on environmental protection. Well, the link is the self. Yoga literally means union. That's what the word yoga means. We think of yoga today, sadly, as an exercise, something we do. I'm going to get fit, I'm going to get strong, I'm going to get flexible. But yoga, yoga is who you are, not what you do. Yoga, we always say, is a noun, not a verb. It's a state of being out of which doing comes, as we were speaking on the banks of Ganga. But it's not this exercise or that exercise or this twisting or that twisting. Yoga is union. And it's ultimately the union of the self and the divine. So it doesn't matter what our religion may be. It doesn't matter what name or form we may use for the divine, what language we use, maybe no name, maybe no form. But that divine, that creator, yoga is the union with that. And so protecting our natural world is the most automatic outcome of that. If I'm living in the illusion of separation, I'm over here, the world is over there, this is me, that's not me. Well, then I can cut down that tree, I can pollute that river, I can throw those women into a sweatshop, I can make food choices that end up causing starvation in the world, I can buy gas-guzzling cars, I can, you know, I can leave a really big violent footprint on the earth because the earth is separate from me. Doesn't matter. I'm over here, the, everything else is over there. But the minute I experience union, which ultimately was what yoga gives us, in that union, there's no longer any place that I end and the earth begins. There's no longer any place that I end and the rivers or the mountains or the trees or the women in the sweatshop or the child laborers or the starving children. No place that I end and they begin. And so we start to conserve our natural world in the same way that we start to care for those around us in a more loving way because that is yoga. It's both the beginning of yoga and the outcome of yoga. If you look actually at the eight limbs of yoga given by the sage Patanjali, the very first limb, asana is only limb three. Eight limbs, asana is number three. So if you were building a building, for example, asana would be your third floor. Well, long before you can get to the third floor, there's a foundation, there's a first floor, there's a second floor. You can't just, you know, zap your way up to the third floor without a foundation. And the yamas and the niyamas are really the foundation of yoga. I'm not going to go into them here except to mention that the very first yam is nonviolence, ahimsa. The second is truthfulness. The third is non-stealing, asteya. And I mention this because that's the stuff that natural preservation is made of. Violence doesn't just mean I walk out with a machine gun and kill my neighborhood. It doesn't just mean I go and I rape a woman on the street. Violence is in how we're moving through our day what we eat, what we buy, what we wear, how we live, how we speak, the choices we make. 
that footprint on the earth is violent. Regardless of what form it takes. And so when we practice yoga, we begin with nonviolence as, a, as an instruction, as a commandment. You know, long before I've gotten into asana, long before I've gotten into pranayama, long before I've gotten all the way up into meditation and samadhi, nonviolence is what I'm told. Begin here. But then nonviolence also comes later on from a much more enlightened state. In the beginning, I have to remember it. Ahimsa, nonviolence. Yes, this is my foundation. But once I've actually experienced the union of yoga, then nonviolence comes automatically. Then the yamas and the niyamas are no longer things I have to leave, you know, sticky notes on my computer for. Oh, wait, right, what was the eighth one again? It, it becomes second nature becomes who I am. You know, a mother does not need to set an alarm to remind her to go check on her baby when the baby's crying. The baby cries. That is the alarm. The mother goes to take care of the baby. The baby turns over in bed. A sound that no one in the world could possibly hear, an imperceptible sound. But the mother in the other part of the house, heard it, felt it, sensed it. Ah, she's awake, he's awake, let me go. They're going to be hungry. It's automatic. It's the most natural byproduct of being a mother. And in the same way, when we are united with the divine, the way that a mother is united with her child, the sleep, the wake, the aches, the pains, the hunger, the thirst of that with which we are connected calls us to it. We don't need the reminders. It becomes second nature. So conservation of nature plays a role in the very beginning in the yamas and niyamas, right there, non-violence, right there, non-stealing, non-hoarding. A non-vegetarian diet is stealing, is hoarding. Not just the meat of the animals, that's not, what, not even what I'm talking about, but it's stealing and hoarding the grain on earth. The vast majority of grain being grown is actually being fed not to people, but to animals who become not the ones who work our fields, but the ones who become our hamburgers, our hot dogs, and, our, our hot dogs and chicken McNuggets. The United Nations produced a report saying that the meat industry is the single greatest contributor to global warming. The water usage the water usage in one meal of beef is the equivalent water that you would use for bathing for six months. And not, not bathing the way people bathe in India, like from one bucket, but bathing from a shower head that runs for eight minutes a day, every day, for six months. You would use approximately 10,000 liters about 2,500 gallons of water, which is about the amount of water that goes into the production of a pound of beef. Now, I mention this because when we talk about nonviolence, well, obviously it's violent to eat the meat, but it's not just violent to the animal. It's violent to those who are starving, whose grain we are eating. It's violent to those who don't have water. It's violent to the farmers whose fields are desiccated. So it's violent to the earth. So when we talk about asteya, apigraha, non-stealing, non-hoarding, our whole lifestyle comes in. I just gave one example of what we eat, how we shop, how we live. It's all there. So 
conservation comes in at the very beginning, even before I get to the asanas. And then as I move through yoga and actually experience divine union, well, then I could no more harm the world than I could harm myself because I understand the world is self. So it's there on both levels and throughout it all.